let me start, please, with the person in whom sho whose shoes I'm standing this evening. And uh, I, I appreciate Keith entrusting me with this. So thank you, Keith. Keith, is a, a Keith Flynn is an award-winning author of eight books, including six collections of poetry, most recently, Colony Collapse Disorder from Wings Press and The Skin of Meaning, and two collections of essays, The Rhythm Method, Razzmatazz, and Memory, How to Make Your Poetry Swing, and The Prosperity Gospel, Portraits of the Great Recession. He was a lyricist and lead singer for the nationally acclaimed rock band, The Crystal Zoo, from 1984 to 1999. And he's the executive director and producer of the TV and radio show Live at White Rock Hall and Animal Sounds Productions. He is also a part of a larger tradition of poetry and anthology publishing and creativity that includes writing and musicians in video and audio formats. His award-winning poetry and essays have appeared in many journals, Crazy Horse, uh, Words, Word and Witness, 100 Years of North Carolina Poetry. He's the founder and managing editor of the Asheville Poetry Review, which began publishing in 1994. And I really appreciate that Keith is here this evening. I've had a chance to listen to him present and read. And it's always a pleasure. He's with us here this evening. So I hope that you'll all do um, your virtual huzzas, your finger snaps, and your celebrations of Keith Flynn, who virtual audience is here for us. And then we're going to hear from our award-winning poets this evening in order. And I'd like to introduce each of them in order, starting with third place, second place, and then first place. And you'll hear from each of them. So please let me introduce, first of all, Annalena Phillips Bell and tell you a little bit about Annalena. Annalena is the author of Ornament, winner of the Vassar Miller Poetry Prize and the chapbook, Smaller Songs from St. Bridget Press. Uh, new writing appears or is forthcoming in Southern Review and Evergreen Review. Annalena's work has received support from the Siwani Writers Conference, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, and the Marvel House Project. Annalena is the winner of the 2021 Winter Anthology Contest, and she teaches in the Creative Writing Department at UNC Wilmington and is the edi editor of Echotone. And you can learn more about Annalena at annalenaphillipsbell.net. So Annalena will be going first. And uh, then we'll have Christina Hutchins, the second place winner. Christina Hutchins' second book, Tender the Maker, won the May Swenson Award of Utah State University Press. And her first collection was The Stranger Dissolves, a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award and the Audre Lord Publishers Triangle Award. Christina has also published a chapbook Radiantly We Inhabit the Air, which won the Robin Decker Prize for Queer Poetry. Christina's poems have appeared in the Antioch Review, the Denver Quarterly, Prairie Schooner, uh, the Southern Review, Women's Review of Books, and the awards, the accolades, include the Missouri, Missouri Review of Editor's Prize, the National Poetry Review's and the Annie Finch Prize and a fellowship to St. Petersburg, Russia. And recently, a summer of living at Robert Frost's home in New Hampshire as the Dartmouth poet in residence. Christina Hutchins currently teaches privately and has previously worked as a congr congregational minister and a biochemist. And then we'll have our first place winner, Mara High. Let me tell you just a little bit about Mara. Mara was born in Wales and now lives in Carborough, North Carolina. Carborough, we, a lot of us know Carborough and we love it there, where she works as a freelance copy editor. 
Her poems have appeared in various print and online literary magazines, such as North Carolina Literary Review, Passenger, Rhino, Southern Review, Tar River Poetry, and The Fair. Mara is the author of The Garden of Persuasions from Jakar Press, and Mara collaborated with the artist Lyric Kennard on Stone Water Time. Another collaboration is a chat book entitled The Abandoned Field with the printmaker Jean Leclusset. I hope that was correct, Mara. Please forgive me if that was not, which is underway. And many of Mara's poems draw on what she learned while working with the Nature Conservancy, especially with their prescribed burn crews in the sand hills and coastal plains of the state. Mara's website is marahigh.com. So again, we'll be hearing third place, second place, first place. That's Annalena, Christina, and Mara. We'll begin with Annalena. Thank you all so much for being here. It's an honor and a pleasure to celebrate you. And thank you so much for being with Malaprops, where we can highlight your work, celebrate your work, and expand our community of authors and poets and fulfill that vision that our founder Emika had 41 years ago. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Patricia. It's a delight to be with y'all. I live on the other end of the state, but I love Malaprops. And whenever I'm in Asheville, I like to come by. So it's really delightful to be here with y'all on the screen. I also want to say a big thanks to Keith, who we were lucky to hear his beautiful voice earlier. If you're watching on YouTube, you haven't gotten that pleasure this evening, but just huge thanks for the work you do. I know from experience that editing is a lot of work and it's a labor of love and I'm so appreciative. Um, I'll read, I'll start by reading this poem from this beautiful new issue of Asheville Poetry Review. Scissors. What you would cut is better flat or small to fit the vanishing X, the pointed eye your two blades make when one hand holds both handles, pulls the muscles close in an almost fist, so one from one the pieces fall. A pumping heart propels your knives to sunder paper, flower from stem, and each snip only as sharp as the join holds tight. Brute force can't split every tether. A thousand strings may bind as wire, but in the shift from splayed to single self, from X to I to X, you make free, cut by beat by cut. Two blades, a bolt, a pulsing heart, the scissors song, apart, apart, apart. thought I'd read some poems from my book, Ornament. And I thought that I would read this one called Stitch, since I've just read one about scissors. This is sort of the, the reverse of that. Stitch. Making myself content with what was half plenty. Good, but never what you'd call fine tailoring. I worried out a hole in what I knew of love. Don't move too much in this, your only shirt. It'll all unstitch. And the gap sewed itself into myself. What's missing now is the feel of missing something. Should I be wary, lacking it, or find this double absence sweet? We've cut and pinned our pieces. We have ripped out hymns, unseeming. But in our rending, not a knot is sundered that we cannot base down, sew up, make right. I pinch all I've held apart in case of what? Shut. Now press. Now stitch. Now billow. Splendid. So a lot of the poems in this 
in this book take their inspiration from songs and tunes in the old time Appalachian tradition. And I thought I'd read a couple of those as well. This, this next one is titled after a murder ballad called The Waxweed Girl, which has an unsurprising and grisly end. Um, and that's all I'll say about that, that this is the poem. He brought me a rose, its velvet petals bled. I wore that rose behind my ear all day, though it weighted me off kilter, too big for my head, the rose he brought. Its velvet petals bled on the hallway floor. I left a trail of red that no one followed but him. I was his prey. He tracked the scent of velvet petals blood I wore that rose behind my ear all day. This next one I wrote thinking about this old duet, a couple, E.C. and Erna Ball, who used to sing on the radio in North Carolina. They would come on in between the ads for fertilizer and whatnot and sing some songs. And um, let's see, I believe that she was the accordion player and he was the guitar player, but somebody tell me if I got that wrong. Um, and they would sing these beautiful apocalyptic Christian songs and this is my attempt to reimagine one of them, when the fire comes down from heaven. I hold a finger up to fix the span of every bird whose shadow crosses mine, seeking one who echoes the divine proportion. None fits perfectly, none can. But one soars close, its shining sears my forehead, that gold encompassing all opposites pasture, stream, the house where my love tats lace, two equal filaments of cotton thread held on two silver shuttles a shawl she'll wear when I tread home across the darkening meadow, ablaze with the mark the hawk has made on me. As I trace it on her skin, we'll know each other as well as our hinged and mortal symmetry allows, shadow to body, body to shadow. Here's a little springtime poem, Honeysuckle. For scant weeks in spring when the ground has had time to get warmer and all the white flowers whose forms are so hard to imagine are coming to bloom and the air smells each day of some newness, a sweetness whose name like the scent flags the tip of the tongue, then leaves, leads me onward, leads bees on, leads moths, leads small flies. For who knows which beast every flower is meant to attract and who can collect each one's name. I breathe in as much of the air as will flow through my lungs before sudden, persistent, you lower down over the Piedmont, imparting a one-noted sweetness that has to content us all summer, for only a rare other fragrance can cut through those curtains of sugar. Here is another planty poem. I have a thing for plants, it just happens. This is called Qualifications for One to be Climbed by a Vine. If not utter stillness, at least dedication to sloth. If not sandpaper surface, the texture of knotty fence posts or the trees they were made from. Resistance to gravity, if not pure vertical, angling up and so closer to sunlight. When wavering greenest of greenest, a curling shoot chooses its tangent from rootstock to leaf out, I wonder if I should stand straighter, stiller, or stretch out a finger to capture the waggle of winnowing vine tip. Which one would it wend to? I channel the light pole, the stake and the slender gray post of old cedar, the wire that connects it to others a vine could extend its new tendrils around over hours or days. Could I stand it? Stand still and stay put for enough of a lifetime for waver to wander toward me and find me, describe me in spirals as road leading sunward. And I'll just read one more, um, but before I do, I also want to thank Marilyn Nelson who judged this contest and is who, who is one of my absolute heroes of poetry. 
Um, what an honor. And um, I'm really looking forward to hearing Christina and Maura read this evening. This last one is called Sprout Wings and Fly, and it has stolen its title from a song sung by Tommy Gerald, a fiddler from Round Peak, North Carolina. Um, and I'll try to I'll try to sing a little bit of it without uh, blowing out your speakers. I'll eat when I'm hungry, I'll drink when I'm dry, get to feeling much better, gonna sprout wings and fly. Like a watermelon seed, the geologist said, if you can find one of those these days and hold it between your fingers, squeeze. Like this, the continental plates are squeezing one plate out from between two others. I am no plate, but I feel the weight of continents, resist as schist, but then give in, be squeezed and feel the slip, pressed, launched for myself, heaven in a coconut shell or hell in a hand basket, but finally catapulted from what may be my own fingers. If I am my own torment, if I am God, the capital H hand that presses not to crush, but to propel, palms like dinner plates, palms like granite, the capital G glad mouth that knows better than to eat, lest a seed grow in the belly, replication when the prayer was for shift, that anyhow needs no such nourishment, that instead purses, spits self from self, if only for a brief respite, for the list will never be short enough that I could stand and walk free of it. If I am standing next to my faults, starting from solid ground, if I get to feeling much better in spite of myself, in a spate of say yes, yes to you, little satchel of sums, little seeds sprouted, gone winged, some bright morning, I'm gonna, any day, today, now. Thank y'all, and now we're gonna hear from Christina. That was gorgeous, Annalena. Thank you. And um, thank you to uh, Keith and Asheville Poetry Review. Um, it is a ton of work, what you're doing, and uh, Marilyn Nelson. But I also really wanna um, say thank you to um, Stephanie and Patricia because um, at Malaprop's, because Mrs. Malaprop is my maybe one of the plays I've ever had the most fun watching in ever. So <clears throat> I'm going to read um, the Matthews poem second, but I wanted to start off with a um, a little short poem from Tender the Maker. Uh, I decided because of the the poem that was chosen, I decided to kind of do Pacific Coast poems, which is where I'm located, and um, sort of maybe a more general ocean thing. And um, this is, okay, anyway, this is called Eye of the Storm, Pescadero Coast, 1992. And 1992 was just like this year where we had atmospheric rivers unending. Um, so this, came from that and it also came from, I grew up around the farm workers. Um, there were always farm workers in the field and sometimes in my classes at school. So this is from the coastal fields <clears throat> and it's in honor of um, Cesar Chavez. The same shirt pulled over the same head, not once, but again and again, a eucalyptus turned inside out, brutal, Foam white, the sea tore at its rocky coast. Route one was forsaken. The big house was unlit. The plowed yard, a pool of rain, a cloud ceiling pressed yet lower. Along worn cliffs in the farm workers' small windowed shacks, stoves burned into the dark of the day. It was Sunday but only the storm made it Sabbath. In flooded fields, unharvested Brussels sprouts clung to their stalks. So I'm going to, um, this was the poem that um, Asheville Poetry Review is, has in it. It's called Meeting Memory on the Mendocino Coast. 
A scroll tears, having unrolled half a planet to my ankles. I am one of many centers around which earth arrives from far away and rejoins itself. Beyond my vision slowly turns the Pacific gyre, colony of plastic, a massive physical memory I know is partly my own. Losing sight as I am, sometimes I store the sea preferring itself as when I hike the hills and the one eye that still sees color stores green of greens. Spring in California, among my life's accumulations against loss, my niece in her car seat singing, years ago as I drove home over 17 from Santa Cruz, mid song, she dropped to sleep. Glancing in my mirror, shadows bent of laurels and cedars entered the car and weighing nothing ran across her small hands, arms, cheek, over my sweater tucked around her as a blanket. Such tenderness can't comprehend species die off. But even my eye mostly blind can make out the shrinking of an ice cap. At the place ice meets Arctic water, edges soften as ice and water enter each other's light and space. When I camped in a heat wave on the ice chest's third morning, giant chunks slowly shrinking hit the tipping point and their disappearance accelerated. By afternoon, warm water sloshed around a carton of spoiled milk. Even after a love affair, an old secret we resides in me and how once from an overlook, the coast sun stepped from behind clouds when having thrilled each other with small transgressions, a lover and I turned unspeaking to the panorama. The lover's singular gesture, she lifted herself on her toes whenever she embraced me, though we were the same height. What is melting footprints of the extinct, their exact weight, their stride, how they met? Arctic ice is the planet's memory and it melts faster than my days run. We must study the present as ancient history, throw our minds centuries beyond our vision and look back. Waves have braceleted my limbs with sand and foam. Another stronger wave soaks my rolled pant legs. I'm being claimed by a planet only beginning to remember me, however fleeting, however unforgivable my lasting. So continuing on the um, glacier, part of the ocean. This is Antarctica. This is for my brother who's an oceanographer and a climate scientist and goes to Antarctica a lot. Thwaites Glacier. Were you to spiral to the bottom of the earth, slipping down as you circled a narrowing circumference like the storms that pass over and under icebreakers in the rough southern sea? The same weather system hitting the same ship again, again, as the storm spins up the dizzy path to Antarctica. You might come to a glacier, as to a gate that keeps heaven from spilling into the ordinary world, holding back a great crowd of glaciers waiting to slide into the ocean. An image of Thwaites, largest of glaciers, extending an ice shelf big as the UK, discovered me. And at once, as if a curtain had opened, I saw the future. Currents of warmed water carve the glacier away from below. I have never lain on a grave, but I have climbed and straddled the gravestone. Someone said, 
get down from there, show some respect. I didn't know what she meant then, but seeing the edge of that glacier melting from below, I understand respect for the tears of the dying, tears of the dead. There are rivers on the bottoms of oceans traveling like prayers around and away from the land. The Thwaites Glacier, 3,000 feet thick, floats on rivers, its edge whiter than milk of 24 hours of summer light. A short ice cliff or a slant enters water so clear, the word blue comes to its names. Cobalt, lapis, cerulean, phthalo, and deeper spirit of indigo, the self-shadow of ice. At the edge, the undercarriage uh, clearly melts, softened, a cube left in a glass unattended, a hot day. Hallelujah. Life resides in the church of my mortal bones. I want to breathe with you the cold scent of sublimation, a day without morning or night. Heaven long ago fell and emptied itself at the ice edge of a continent I've never seen. Glory and the passion. Thwaites Glacier disappears from earth so much faster than predicted. The blue, all other blues, merely imitate, bluer than a summer swimming pool full of children, bluer than Mary's dress, bluer than the dolphin tropics blue, bluer than the Sistine Chapel ceiling blue. There is a blue, bluer than the sky behind its streaming kites. This is called um, beach napping. Um, it's self-explanatory. I woke alone as the globe began to enter its shadow. I had a lover who taught me to nap on the beach. I had ever walked and frolicked, thrown balls, swam. She gave me stretched out beside me, her face covered with her hat, her legs twitching, as they did, the gift of awakening to late sun and clouds on the sea, to sanctity breaking aloud in a rising tide. A beach nap, like a hand-me-down jacket, forms a spell of being cared for by someone unknown. Settling into a trustable universe, then waking to the loud envelopes torn open and open, ripping down the coast, to the scallops of foam approaching, hissing, a wider world awakening, like taking off the jacket, rather like having the jacket lifted away from around the body without the motion of a limb. The first time, it was a small beach jammed with flotsam. After we woke, we wandered, two women entering the driftwood sh shacks and a steepled lean-to built and abandoned by others. An alien plant was becoming our own. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Wind and surf had brushed the sand smooth. I let go her hand to pick up a small curve of driftwood and where the rings of a living tree had grown in death, ridges rose under my fingers, soft gray afterlife. I would leave her and hurt her, though in truth, I would miss her too. She loved my body and I hers. For years, we curled around and toward each other when I woke, she was gone. Beside me, a half parenthesis in the sand where her body had slept. When I woke, the world was more mine and I a smaller part. Waves had rippled and crashed into me as sound. 
When I woke, I was Sandy and she brushed off my back. I'm going to close with um, this one called Practicing the Saving um, and addressing the um, communal work we have ahead of us. <clears throat> Sorry. I haven't thought of them for years, but I used to watch cheerleaders on a green field making of their bodies overpass and underpass unsteadily use, their, use one another's palms and backs as rungs of a ladder, then practice their basket toss, grabbing like human wicker, quick weaving itself or a net knotted by the grip of hands around wrists, crisscrossed arms for strings. Over and over the leaping one throwing a self like an earnest ball arced through the air and into the basket. Caught in a riptide, dragging them way out and under two children were disappearing, though the waves seemed small. Their mother saw, ran, and entered the water into the diagonal current, and weak swimmer, she rolled and was carried out. But faster than the end of this line, a human chain was forming. Hands joined at wrists, Strangers were trying to reach the children, the entire sunned crowd on its feet, so many running the chain through the water longer and longer, then lifting and passing the children one at a time back to the beach, then the mother, the family collapsed side by side, breathing. The chain pulling itself out of the sea. The links were people again. Sometimes a diverse species, <clears throat> we make of our bodies what we need, tools where nothing else can reach. I love people who make of their joined freedoms an apparatus against losing the irreplaceable. And the cheerleaders got it. So smoothly catching and rolling their human projectile out of the basket, she popped onto her feet. The human chain, the glory of our species, public and indelible, we do know what to do. Thank you. And I'd like to pass it on to Mora. Mara, actually, I think. Thank you, everybody. I feel like we need some minutes of silence to absorb all of that um, amazing language, precision of language and music and thinking and imagery. And um, <laughs> But I'll offer my poems <laughs> um, such as they are. I'm very grateful. Of course, I'm very glad to see that Keith is here online in person. He sold, he sold, managed to solve his uh, his technical difficulties. So it's it's really good to see. I want to thank you very much for for the review for everything you do for poetry in this state. I'm Carbra's right slap bang in the middle of North Carolina. We have um, independent bookstores all around us and. Uh, they're a delight and a real addition to our, our rich cultural life uh, here. Um, I'll, um, I, I, I also, want, you know, there's just too, too many thanks, um, and they've already been said very eloquently, um, I just echo them. Um, I'll, I'll read you, um, there's so many additional little kind of in the poems that I could read, but I, I'm not quite sure which, which one would follow best from what Annalena and Christina wrote, because it seems like we are, we're actually overlapping in, in many ways and many of our interests and many of our uh, uh, sort of um, passions um, about language and imagery. Um, but let me read, first of all, um, Verbicina Occidentalis. Most of my poetry is extremely local, 
um, like in my backyard or in my yard. And, and I think it has something to do with the fact that I'm not from around here. When people say, where are you from? I can't get away with just saying Cabra, <laughs> but I try. <laughs> okay, Verbicina occidentalis. This is the crown beard. That's the common name of it. Dark does not fall. It rises from the soil, seeping along the flattened grass of the dim path and flowing up trees already black, night's conduits, forked darkening against the retreating light. While below them in the field, the crown beard on its winged stem makes a last effort, waggling its two or three yellow rays, lifting its small cluster of disc petals in imitation of the sun, though its leaves have gone quiet already and the pollinators sleep their insect sleep. Sleep is just a way to talk about what happens in the dark, what cells do, what color green is when no light shines on it and nothing moves under the streetlights in the ramifying subdivisions. Wings close and petals, eyes see nothing that is not inward and radical. There are boundaries such as where stem becomes root and where tap roots probe among stones, and we may travel them through capillaries and waterways and geographies of decomposition. Underground is a reflection of sorts, uncertain and hopeful as seed heads in seed time. Seed time is the wind and seeds quiver in their bracts as brittle as moths are and as dry, as poised as these wing stems which still lean to the light. One good shake and they scatter down the grasses and lodge while the rains come and long hours of dark and cold, while they pass moonlight and sunlight and know already that the root comes first and follows water down the kingdoms of soil, then a tendril and the precursors of leaves, leaf, branch and crown. I hold some in my hand, each husk ribbed and shaped like a vase, like the word promise in their language. In their language, grow is a conversation among cells. Why? Because you go first, yes, you, I, this way. And in this green vein upward, he is sap, sweet and mineral. Like banners held to our view by attending angels, their pronouncements unfurl through the sunlight and all night they hum. The point being seed and more seed, up where their lures dangle, a few long bright petals no need for more when bees enough roam the flowerets, when even one person has leaned closer as if to listen and instead been sounded like a drum struck and reverberating through the field and further. And further along trails, mapping the wood, waysides, how many lives did I pass through and never know its name? By hearsay and by looking in a book, I found a paradise of leaves opposite and ovate, that curious tissue decurrent on the stem, the loose corymbs, taxonomies of desire in a right name, a promise of knowledge and belonging, as in my flower, my field, and so on, until our flower, our dominion. That much was in my gift, a sprig, it's true, while the flowers which know all about belonging, he did light and wind, water calling to them, verbicina, my little word. Word made dicotyledon and vascular, one stemmed perennial aster of the family Asteraceae. Not so much star as constellation, a coming together years in the making, from the time before the field, when it was still wood down to the creek, before the field was abandoned and grew over. Birds fidgeted in the stands, deer crashed through the stiff ribbed stems and found shelter. People walked with their dogs. Linnaeus and his descendants were among the familiars. We left traces on the leaves, on the grass and track a faint phosphorescence in the dark. Um, I think I'm gonna do something quite risky, which is to read a brand new poem. <laughs> I just wrote it. It's, uh, it's about pollen. Those of you who live in North Carolina know what I'm talking about. The poem is called Pollen Counts. Here it comes in great gusts off the loblollies. I see it 
fly up and sift down, down drift, spend drift, anemophilus, blind, how it loves the wind. Heterodox, indiscriminate, miscellaneous, all the pollens at once, grass and tree, the other fall. Into crannies and puddles, marbling the glossy surface of water, a pale sheen on window glass, on cars, organza veils of dust, pollen on all the leaves, on the barren ground of my old body, by the wayside, the long stringy oat catkins and the fat little caterpillar stripoli of the pines, green turning brown, yellow turning brown, and shriveling or sodden with rain on the back deck, the stone steps and patio among the creeping periwinkle of a front yard, piling up at the sewer pipe across the creek, a dam of scum and catkins. Where does the body begin and end? In the wind, in the mycelium, in the soil, among roots, and in the wooden bowl on my desk, my desk. And it wouldn't matter that you were half or more blind, you'd know it was here, in your eyes, in your nose, in your throat, as if you were some tree or early summer grass, some discreet flower ready to be showered with gold. You could feel it, gritty, powdery on glass. You could write pollen with your fingertip in your best cursive on the car windows. Like Christina, I have one gummy eye. I can only see through one eye. <laughs> it's another reason to look carefully at things. Um, I, I think I might have used up at all my time, so I'll stop there. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and uh, we'll see what there is in the way of questions. Thank you. Can you guys hear me all right? Well, it's a pleasure to get to see you, Keith, and I'm delighted that you are here. And the things that I think you had planned to say earlier I hope you feel comfortable with saying now as a now. as a fitting tribute and compliment to, to celebrating uh, Asheville Poetry Review. It's a pleasure to see you again. Thank you, can you hear me, you guys? Um, thank you so much for taking care of uh, this for us, the hosting. Uh, I'm so moved by everyone. Uh, Oops, I, <laughs> Keith, I can't quite hear you, and I'm not sure if you, perhaps you need to be a little, maybe a little closer. Is that, is that close? <laughs> Can you hear me now? I think it's the muting of the other, maybe the muting of the other computer. But Hold on a now, now I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Hold on. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, everybody, this is a wonderful lesson in uh, patience with the technology that we're all learning to use. Keith, how does it sound now? I don't know. What do you think? Uh, amazing and fantastic. Listen to the, as I'll quote Stephanie here. Stephanie mentioned your dulcet tones, and mm -hmm. I think we've got them. So, Keith, take it I away. That, well, I'm so moved by the readers here. I have apologized profusely for the technical difficulties on my end. Um, I live, uh, I'm actually coming to you from a hundred year old church called, it's called White Hall, once upon a time, it was called White Rock Presbyterian Church, and we picked it up and moved it on top of this mountain, and uh, we jacked it up 18 feet, we built a first floor under it, and then we, uh, coming to you from the second floor in the sanctuary. Um, uh, can you still hear me okay, everybody? I want to talk a little bit about um, Bill Matthews, for whom this prize is named. Uh, Bill is a uh, was a poet 
It was taken away from us way too soon in his mid fifties. Um, he won the National Book Critics Circle Award in 1995. He won the Ruth Lilly Award in 97. He was born in Cincinnati in 1942, and he was educated at Yale and the University of North Carolina. And uh, at the time of his death in 97, he was a professor of English and director of the writing program at the uh, City University of New York. Um, I want to do a poem for him of his for a friend of mine named Elliot Wadopian. Elliot died earlier this year uh, of a uh, heart attack. And um, he and I performed this poem many places. He was one of the greatest bass players that I ever heard. And uh, I want to, uh, I want to give a little bit of an homage to him and to Bill Matthews uh, right here. This is called Mingus and Diaspora. You could say, I suppose, that he ate his way out. Like the prisoner who starts a tunnel with a spoon. Or you could say, he was one in whom nothing was lost, who took it all in. Or you could say that he was big as a bus. He would say, and he did in one of those blurred melismatic slaloms that his sentences ran, for all the music was in his speech, swift switches of tempo, stop time, double time, Lord Mingus could talk in six, eight. I just ruined my body, he would say. And there, exhibit A, it stood. That Parthenon fat, the tenant voice lifted, as we say, since words are a weight and music and silence is lighter than air. For the air we know rises, but to the edge of the atmosphere, you have to pick up the bass, the bass, as Mingus called his with audible capitals and think of the slow years the wood spent as a tree, which might well have been enough for wood. And think of the skill of the bass maker carried without great thought that bass from home to the shop and back for decades and know what bassists before you have played and know how much of this is stored in the bass like energy in the spring and how you must coax it all out. How easy it might be Instead, to pull a sword from a stone. But what's inside the base wants out. The way one day you will want out of this life. Religious stories, they are rich in symmetry. But you must release as much of this hoard as you can, little by little, in perfect time, as the work of the body becomes a body of work. I let a song go out of my heart. I bruised my beloved's heart by inattention, and I saw the smolder in her eyes too late, of course. For I hadn't, I thought myself, not to watch myself and not to pay attention to her. And for what? This lump of silence, the tatty truths of loneliness. When love drew near, I threw salt over my shoulder. Accidente, I thought. For dross, for cigarette ash, for the scent of all my body for dust to which we must all return, but to which we must not speed. Once the siege is done, the fort becomes a prison. So I've made this dirge by which I can begin to teach myself to sing. I want to uh, thank you so much today for everybody that came and attended this. I want to thank Malaprops for having us and for being 
uh, such a fantastic partner to me all these years. Emika and I have been friends for over 40 years. Uh, she's been on the board for the Asheville Poetry Review uh, for going on 30 years. Next year will be our 30th anniversary issue. Um, and uh, one of the first readings I ever gave when I was uh, barely 20 years old was at the old Mallow Props bookstore in the basement. And I read with Olivia Bortnoli, who was kind enough to uh, uh, let me join her as a uh, undergraduate poet and trying so hard to find my voice. Uh, Milo Props has always supported the Asheville Poetry Review. They've always supported my work and they've always supported all of the artists of the region in a way that no other independent bookstore that I'm aware of does. And that's important. They've become a central fulcrum in the middle of a magnificent and burgeoning and constantly moving scene. And I'm very happy about uh, our partnership that's gone on all these years. And um, I'm very happy to be here with you tonight. Uh, sorry to not be here at the beginning, um, but uh, I eventually found another old computer that I plugged in. <laughs> and, and that's how I was able to figure this out. Um, I wanna do one more poem for you. And uh, this is from uh, my book, The Skin of Meaning. And um, then we'll call it an evening. Thank you so much, Mara, Christina, and Annalena. Uh, your poetry is absolutely beautiful. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to be able to share that poetry with the world and uh, to let folks to get a, any, any little bit that we can al allow your work to seep out there in, into the consciousness of everyone else is very, very important to me. Um, I want to... Uh, implore you to get yourself a copy of the Asheville Poetry Review. This is what it looks like. Um, it's a particularly beautiful issue. I know we are known for our covers, but I would like you to go to Malaprops and buy one and support our mission. And um, this last poem I'm going to read is called Like a Buddha, Paul Motion says. When Paul Motion played drums, he seemed hardly there. A swish, a stir, and then with the whimsy of a ghost slowly rising from the vent, several frozen colors came splashing rapidly down, like flushed birds in the distance. It's the sound an exploding dandelion might make if it were made of tin when all else stopped and silence strained at its bit, listening for him. I support the band, he asserted. I am an accompanist. I'm there to make it happen, not to linger. Like when I made Monk twirl, he says, stirring the air with his finger. What else is there? He shrugs, he plays with his teeth. I know that a far greater country exists here, he asserts. I have set my foot down on it. There are many rhythms occurring all at once, layers of strings. His eyebrows sting and sharpen. Why ask, he says. He becomes restful and folds his hands inside one another. And I know there are perfectly good explanation for, for the simultaneous risks we juggle. There are shipyards of baubles and harbors that have dried up and martinis made up by Episcopalians that burnish them for the plagiarisms of the Holy Spirit. It's only right that the room is furnished with importance and low light. I say to him, you got to flaunt the groove, right, Paul? With flourishes and gentle force, I guess. You got to play like a Buddha, Paul Motion says. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. 
And I appreciate so much your support of the Asheville Poetry Review for all these years. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Stephanie, for having us. It is a pleasure to have you all and to uh, listen to you read. One of the comments from the YouTube chat was, uh, even though they had read the poetry review, the Asheville Poetry Review and your work, it was so moving to hear you all read. And I think that's what's so vital and uh, keeps us going even in a virtual world where we can still be connected to you. And we, we persevere and overcome technological difficulties. And that's part of being creative and getting the word out there. Before we go, I would just love to thank you all and to welcome any final comments any of the poets have uh, this evening, and, and no pressure, you don't have to have a final comment, or your words stand uh, for themselves. But before we go, please, if there's any final things you'd like to share, please feel free. I want to thank you all, uh, Annalena, Christina, Mara, Keith, and, and of course, Stephanie, uh, Director of Author Events, for bringing us all together. We wish you all well. Thank you, virtual audience, for being here. And until we meet again, we wish you safe travels and good tidings. And please read some poetry and support your Exactly. That's books. what I would say. Go out there, <laughs> write the poems, go to the readings, buy the books. Um, just just to keep it all moving, keep it all circling. You are part of this community. Octavio Paz says that we are an immense minority. Dear poets, we are an immense minority. <laughs> Thank you all, and uh, have a wonderful evening.